Hey, it's great to be with you today, and I'm so excited to uh, start a series with you, but I'm not going to get into that just yet. Spoiler alert, right? Uh, but I want to read a passage of scripture from you found in Psalm 18 to call us into worship. And I pray that you would just lean into these words because I think uh, they're so powerful and they just describe our loving Lord so, so much. Listen to what the psalmist says. He says, I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock where I seek refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise and I was saved from my enemies. Isn't that awesome? I mean, that, that is, I think that articulates so well who our loving God is, right? Our Heavenly Father, where at times we seem all alone, it seems like everything's pressing in and it's scary, but yet we turn and He's there. We turn and He's pursuing us the entire time. And it's just, it just is so uh, uh, heartwarming to read a passage of Scripture and to draw us in to the presence of our Heavenly Father who loves us so much. I pray that you will just be excited to encounter and to uh, anticipate uh, spending, encountering uh, our Father and, and lifting Him up and bringing Him the glory He so deserves. I search the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise the Treasures that fade Are never enough Then you came along And put me back together Every desire is now satisfied
Okay, so today, if you consider yourself a Christian, my goal in, uh, in this teaching today, my goal, two, two things. I got two goals in this teaching. Number one, if you consider yourself a Christian, my goal is that you would stop being one. Number two, the other goal would be for this. If you are someone who do not consider yourself as a Christian, I want you to never become one. Well, that sounds weird, doesn't it? Two goals, right? Now, before you click it, this, before you turn this off, uh, I need you to lean in, okay? Because this, there's a there's a point to this. So don't think I'm being heretical. Uh, don't get up and turn off the the um, the TV here, right? Don't just click it off. But I want you to lean in. Because two things we're going to talk about today, or I shouldn't say two things we're going to talk about, which we're going to talk about these, but two goals is that if you are a Christian, my goal for you would be to stop being Christian. And number one, and number two, if you if you aren't a Christian, that you would not become a Christian. Now that sounds really odd, doesn't it? And hopefully you don't uh, you don't turn off the TV, but instead you listen, you lean into this, and you don't wipe me out as being a heretic, right? So, would you just lean into this and listen? Would you just kind of track with me? Because today we're starting a new series. But before we get into that, I want to read a passage of Scripture to you. Matthew 4, 18-20 says this, As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, He saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and followed him. Now that seems like a simple story, right? But there's, but it's very profound. There's a couple things I want us to really lean into. It's very profound, and that is this: there is a difference between a Christian and a Christ follower. Now that goes back to my goals that I just shared with you, right? Number one, if you are a Christian, could you stop being one? Number two, if you're not a Christian, don't ever sign up to be a Christian. Why? Because there is a huge difference, huge difference that I want to talk to you about in this new series, a huge difference between being a Christian and a Christ follower. The delineation, the delineation between a Christian and a Christ follower. So today we're going to start a new series called The Lake Effect, okay? And who doesn't like to be at the lake in the summertime, right? We're in Michigan, many of you guys, not us, not me, have lake homes or you know cabins up north and things like that where over the summer we want to take off. Maybe it's camping, maybe we have a lake home, whatever it is, but it's, we want to get off to the lake. We want to go camping. We want to get out and enjoy creation, right? We want to enjoy God's creation. We want to just enjoy life. And so this series, we're going to talk about, uh, the series is called uh, The Lake Effect, okay? And what that means is this. Essentially, when Jesus was teaching and he was walking here on earth, many of his teachings happened around the, a, a lake called Lake Gennaraset, okay? Lake Gennaraset, or an easier way of saying it, uh, the Sea of Galilee, okay? They're, they're simult- they're the two, they're, they use those two titles for the same body of water. Lake Gennaraset, uh, Gennesaret, sorry, Lake Gennesaret, also known as the Sea of Galilee, okay? So, but, so... As we engage in this series, he, he talked and had some very profound uh, teachings, some in, very, very interesting uh, conversations and interactions with people around this body of water. Okay, And so we're going to lean into this for the next four weeks. We're going to lean in and we're going to talk about several different encounters that Jesus had with some of his followers around this body of water and what that relationship looked like. Okay, So that's what we're going to do. Okay, and so Today we're going to talk about... Um, we're going to talk about fishing, okay? We're going to talk about fishing, and we're going to look at, more in particular, we're going to look at his intentions, and that is the calling of his first disciples, okay? So that's what, we're, you know, today we're going to look at this whole concept when Jesus said, follow me. Because when he uh, passed by Peter and Andrew and said, follow me, we got to understand something. It probably wasn't some cold call. Meaning that this isn't some guy that they had never seen before, they had never heard about. 
uh, that just walked by and all of a sudden he yells out to these two guys, hey, come follow me, and they just immediately got up and followed him. I, I think it was a little bit different than that. It, I mean, just, just explore this thought with me for a second. Um, his name would have already been circulating. This person by the name of Jesus, it had already been circulating, okay? And so there would have been a bit of familiarity. For instance, if we, if, if there was a, if, if Jesus would have came uh, to this area, to Blissfield, to Adrian, to Petersburg, to, um, you know, Palmyra, uh, you know, certain areas, Sand Creek, certain areas around here, we would have probably heard about him. And we would have probably, uh, our, our curiosity probably would have arrested us, and we probably would have gone and, and checked him out. Who is this person by the name of Jesus? Uh, you know, we've heard that his teachings are, is completely amazing. Uh, he says things that we've never heard before. He's, he, he's kind of doing some things that we've never seen before. So it really probably wasn't a cold call whatsoever because his name would have started... Um, being generated, okay, generated around that area. And so as these two brothers were going about the family business, this is what they were raised in, this was their family business, uh, this fishing business, uh, perhaps they were taking a break for a couple hours and uh, from here and there, and they would go and they would check out Jesus or whatever, maybe see him, I don't whatever it may be. They would cross paths because people were talking about this person by the name of Jesus. And so when they hear him say, come follow me, this wasn't, now I want you to lean into this. When they heard him say, come follow me, this wasn't a call for them to leave the fishing business and go into the religion business. That's not, I, that's not what it was about. It wasn't about them leaving the fishing business and going into the religion business to change careers, but it was something that would radically change their whole lives. Okay? Think about it. We're not talking about professions here. We're talking about a call to come follow this person that would radically change every aspect of their lives, not just their careers. Do you see where we're already starting to get on that path, where it's easy to get on that path and begin to think, oh, that meant just changing careers. You see, that's why we're having this discussion. <laughs> that's why we're going to be spending time talking about this and delineating the difference between Christians and a Christ follower. Okay? This wasn't about changing careers, but it was about uh, literally their whole lives being transformed by this guy by the name of Jesus. Notice something that Jesus didn't say. Jesus didn't say, hey, come, Christians. That's not what he said. There's an author by the name of Don Everts, and he wrote a book called Jesus with Dirty Feet. And in that book, he makes this quote. Jesus was not a Christian. He never asked anyone to become a Christian. He never built a steepled building. He never drew up a theological treatise. He never took an offering. He never wore religious garments. He never incorporated for tax purposes. He simply called people to follow him. That's it. That, despite its simplicity, is it. He called people to follow him. Peter and Andrew's theology was as pure as it gets. Jesus said, follow me, and we did. There's a big difference here, okay? I like the way Everts articulates that. Jesus didn't say, just come follow me. Or, or come be a Christian, but instead he said, come follow me. So think about this. Follow me was not a call to change the belief part of their lives and start believing certain things. It wasn't about just changing, hey, I'm going to change the belief part of your lives so that you will just start believing certain things. Follow me was not a call to change the behavior part of their lives and start doing certain things. Instead, follow me was a call to follow with their whole entire life. Huge difference. And that's what I want us to really lean into today. Because Jesus is issuing that same call to me and that same call to you today to follow Him. And that is far different than what I believe most people think when they hear the word Christianity or Christian. For instance, let's just talk about a few brutal facts, okay? A couple facts. In a Gallup poll in 2014, so this is kind of dated, all right? In a Gallup poll in 2014, 
that 76% of the people of the United States, of our country, considered themselves to be Christians. 76% considered themselves to be Christians. Now, if you stop and think about that, there, that's a lot of people, right? 242 million people to be exact around that. So, but, but these are people that are saying that they are self-identifying Christians, emulating the actions and attitudes of Jesus. Are they following? I mean, think about that. Are they truly following him? 76 percent. 76 percent. In 2014, now that could be less now, right? But 76 percent of Christians, of, the United, of people in the United States, claimed to be Christians, which meant they identified themselves, that they, would, they are emulating the actions and attitudes of Jesus. They are following him. What do you think? And just a year before that, when they set out to answer some questions, the goal of the study was to determine whether Christians have the actions and attitudes of Jesus as they interact with other people. So these people that identified, you know, they were trying to ascertain uh, individuals that claimed to be Christians, did they emulate, did they act, or have the same actions and attitudes of Jesus as they interacted, to, uh, interacted with um, other, uh, other individuals, okay? And what they find, found out was, they found out that over half, over half of these self-identified Christi Christians in the United States are characterized by having the attitudes and actions researchers identified more as pharisaical than of Jesus. Does that make sense? They were more about things that, that a, a pharisaical nature, right? Maybe the, uh, the accumulation or the acclamation uh, or acquirement of knowledge of the Bible, right? But the actions and attitudes was not there. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? They found that over half of those people, instead of identifying with Jesus, they emulated more a pharisaical approach. In fact, they, only, they found that 14%, only 14% of these self-identified Christians, and that means just one out of every seven, does, do seem to represent the actions and attitudes of Jesus. And in the middle of those are, 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 are a mix of action and attitude, okay? That's really interesting to me. Very interesting. So it seems, if we could just pull that data, it seems that there are a lot of people, the majority of people that call themselves Christians, it doesn't seem to show up in their actions nor their attitudes. Which means a person doesn't necessarily need to follow Jesus to call themselves, him or herself, a Christian. So, being a Christian is often just about parts of our lives. Okay? Does that make sense? So what I'm saying is this. According to this study done by Gallup, it seems to suggest that there is a high percentage of individuals that identify themselves as Christians, but their actions and attitudes don't really emulate the ones of Jesus as it relates to other people, their actions and attitudes towards other people. What it seems to indicate is that there's a very small percentage of individuals, of that 76% or whatever the majority of people, that truly understands what it means to follow Jesus. And by, by that, it means that they actually do emulate in their actions and their attitudes that of Jesus. Okay? That's very interesting. And because of that, what, that, what I think we can deduce from that is that there is a large majority of people, maybe us, maybe you, that identify yourself as a Christian only parts of your life. Only parts of your life would be, you know, identified as a Christian. Okay? Now, what is, the, you know, so when we talk about, when we talk about, you know, what that, what that means is, or let me ask yourself, let me ask you this question first. Let me, let me ask, it, ask you this. If you consider yourself a Christian, is that what it means to you? Is it just about some parts of your life? Where, like, I've got this knowledge, so therefore that equates me to be a Christian. I know what it means to be a Christian, so therefore I'm a Christian. Do, is that how we identify following Jesus or what it means to be a Christian? To believe certain spiritual things are true and we participate in a few Christian spiritual activities, so at the end of the day, that therefore equates me as being a Christian. 
Could I say that the world doesn't need more individuals that identifies themselves as Christians like that? That's not whole living. That's only partial living, partial life living as a Christian. Okay. Last week we talked about living out of our God-created identity. Remember? And we talked about how we were transformed. We talked about our true self, what? Equals knowing, speaking, and acting. And knowing is, is we, what we know is rooted in, in, in biblical context, right? But it doesn't stop there. It, it, it flushes itself out in how we, te how we speak, our attitudes, how we talk. It's not about our opinions, but it's about what the Bible says. You know what I'm saying? So our true self is literally transformed. It's not how we identify true self. And could it be that that's what we're doing here when we call ourselves a Christian? At times, we are the ones that, I, that identifies what it means to be a Christian instead of allowing the Word of God to identify what it means to be a Christ follower. Again, I'm not trying to split hairs here. I'm trying to look at this to say and ask ourselves the question, do we truly understand what it means to be a Christ follower or are we buying into a false narrative of what it means to be a Christ follower? Because being a Christ follower means it is a whole life experience. It means that when we say yes, that means our whole entire life is transformed. Just like with these guys, it's about putting down our nets. When Jesus calls us to leave behind our nets, just like he did them, he's calling us to leave behind, what does that mean? It means we leave behind our identity, and it means we leave behind our security. Okay? Think about it. How do you think about yourself? How do you identify yourself? If someone says, hey, you know, wh who are you? How do you start talking? You know, how do you start describing yourself? How would you articulate yourself? How do you define yourself? Maybe we start talking about what we're good at. Our successes, what we've done, our accomplishments, right? That's one way that we identify ourselves or define ourselves. Or possibly what we do for a living. Let me tell you about my career. Let me tell you about my job. Or that I'm a student or whatever. And so we, we may talk about what we do as a living, as we define ourselves. Perhaps we talk about the stuff we have when we define ourselves. Well, I'm this person, I live in this neighborhood, I live in this subdivision, and I have this house, and I have this type of car, or these toys, or whatever. I have a, you know, I have a boat on the lake, you know, whatever it is. And I'm not saying all these things are wrong. I'm just saying, is that how we define ourselves? We might talk about ourselves and define ourselves in relationships. Well, who are you? Well, I'm married. I have a wife. I have children. I'm single. I'm engaged. Or I'm a mom. I'm a dad. I'm a grandfather. I'm a grandmother. Whatever it is. Aunt and uncle. I mean, whatever it is. How do you define yourself? What is your identity? How would you, how would you define yourself? Because that's where we tend, a lot of times, we get sidetracked and we tend to to get our sense of identity and security from those things of, of how we now again I want to say it again there's nothing wrong with those things inherently there's nothing wrong with those things however that's not what defines a Christ follower so in Matthew 10 37 I want you to listen to the words of Jesus he says this, if you love your father, and this is, let me just say this real quick. This is one of those passages of scriptures that over the years has really intrigued me and was very disturbing before I truly understood what it meant. Okay. And I remember years ago, I, you know, I finally realized what it meant. I was like, wow, that's very powerful. I want you to listen to these words because it doesn't sound Jesus. It sounds so un-Jesus like. Jesus says this, if you love your father or your mother more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. Or if you love your son or your daughter more than me, you are not worthy of being mine. Did you hear those words? Does that sound like Jesus? Jesus is saying, if you love your father or your mother more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. Or if you love your son or your daughter more than me, you're not worthy of being mine. In one translation, it says, if you don't hate your father and mother. Now, can you imagine that? Can you imagine him speaking that back then in those days? I mean, isn't that very, even today when we read that, doesn't that kind of rock you? You say, well, that's not what he really meant. What he really meant is, is this, okay? He, it, it, it has to do with the identif it has to do with how we define love. And what he's saying is this, the most intense love you have, whether it be, it, typically it's for your parents, typically it's for your family, okay? Let's just be honest, typically it's for those people that you love, your father, your mother, your kids, and what he's saying is this, if the love you have for me it doesn't exceed that love, you don't really love me. 
The most intense love that you would define, what is it? You know, the most intense love that you would define, if your love for me is not greater than that, you're not worthy of following me. I should be number one in your life. I sh you, your love for me, the love, that, no, this is what it really means here. The love that you have for the, most, for the people that you love the most, whatever you love the most, you know, those people that you love the most, the love, that should seem like hate because your love for me is that, is that intense. Wow, are you catching that? That is a powerful statement. That is a powerful statement. Jesus calls people into a radical redefini redefinition of who they are and what they will live and die for. Matthew 10, 39, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. That is very powerful statements. So being a Christian, if you could, if you could see this, sometimes people who identify themselves as Christians, they're holding on to a part of their life and they're trying to save it. And Jesus is saying, that's not going to work. It's not going to work. A Christ follower is someone who's willing to risk it all. A Christ follower is someone that's willing to put down their nets, to put down their identity, to put down everything and follow Him with every aspect of their life. That's what it means to follow Jesus. Can you imagine if that is really, which I believe it is, if that is really the, the call to discipleship, the call to followership, what it means to truly be a Christ follower, man, does that not reset everything? Does that not kind of reset the whole scales? Does that not kind of put a whole new level of definition on things? Because I want to tell you something, and again, I'm human, you're human, I get that we struggle at times, I get that we want to pursue our humanness, I understand that. And I know Jesus does too, because He is about grace and love. And there's times where we're going to fall into that trap, and we're going to, you know, we're going to be persuaded and dissuaded and de deceived, I get that. But I'm just saying, for the most part, who is it that we're truly following? What do we truly love? Are we truly a Christ follower, or would we say, yeah, I'm more of a Christian because I'm still trying to hang on to pieces of my life. And, and if you think about it, it's like we, we, we just don't want to, it's like we don't want to surrender lordship, the lo parts of our lives over to his lordship. We want to hang on. And I get, that's what I believe is spiritual maturity. I believe that, to be honest with you, I kind of, I believe that that's more of our sanctification process as Jesus, as the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and continually kind of, you know, uh, convicts us and leads us, you know, we begin to, to give up more and more and more of control of our lives because we're wanting, because we want to follow Him. He, he, we're allowing Him to redefine our lives. We, so we, 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 our whole lives are being redefined. We, our, our passions are redefined, right? Our passions are literally redefined. Let me tell you something. Our passions drives us. What you're in love with is going to drive you. What you are truly in love with will drive you. There's a guy by the name of Jonah uh, Lair. I think that's how you pronounce his last name. And he wrote a book called How We Decide. And he says this about emotion and passions. He says this, Emotion and motivation share the same Latin root, movere, which means to move. The world is full of things, and it is our feelings that help us choose among them. What we care about, what we're passionate about, Ends up, drive, ends up driving us more than what we believe. Isn't that powerful? And a lot of times we'll say, no, 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 no. I don't believe that. Maybe we're in denial. Maybe we need to step back and truly look. Maybe we need to truly look. Look at Jesus' life. What drove him? I think the things that drove him was the will of the Father and loving God and loving others. We just talked about this through this whole, that whole uh, seri five week series we did, Emotionally Healthy Relationships. Matthew 22, verses 37 through 39. What is the greatest commandment? Love God with everything you've got. Love others. I'm paraphrasing that. Love God, love others. What did Jesus, lo Jesus absolutely loved God. It was all about the Father's will, was it not? And then in Mark 1, it says this, Jesus saw people and was filled with compassion. I believe Jesus was all about loving God and loving others. You see, Christians are defined by what they believe, but Christ followers are defined about what they truly care about. We're, you're going to see it through their actions. Remember us talking about that. Actions and attitudes. 
That's how you know what someone truly believes. That's a Christ, a Christ follower, someone where their actions and their attitudes have been arrested by the love of God and what they love are the things of God. And, they, and it's shown. They're passionate about what Jesus is passionate about. Christians can become very defined about just what they believe. Well, I've memorized all this scripture. I've done this. I've done that. You know, I've done all the Christian things. Isn't that what a Pharisee is? When we talk about Pharisees, wasn't that the, the leading council, the church, the leaders of the time back then? This is who we are. We've memorized this. This is how we follow the law. It, you know, it was all about that. It wasn't about, you know, you know, one time Jesus even told them, you worship, you worship the Bible and you're, you're missing out on what the, what the word, it's, well, of course they didn't have the Bible at the time, but the law, right? You're worshiping the word, you're worshiping the law, but you're not worshiping what the law is pointing to, which was him, right? Christians can be defined about what they believe, whereas Christ followers are defined truly about what they care about, that passion and initiative, Okay. Christians might define, as I already said this, define spiritual maturity by how much you know, things you've done. I've memorized all kinds of scripture, therefore I'm a Christian and I am a mature Christian or I'm a deep Christian, right? It amazes me right now, and again, I'm not saying we don't study the Word of God, but it amazes me sometimes how Christians, Christians can become so passionate about studying things in the Word of God that are gray even, that are gray aspects when, when Jesus is returning, when Jesus said he doesn't even know when he's returning, they can become so passionate about studying the eschaton, eschatology, that they miss out on loving others. It, is an amaz it just amazes me. It's like, hey, the one thing we do know, Jesus is returning, and he's returning for his people. He's returning for his church, his bride. Maybe we should understand that, yes, we can study Scripture, but maybe it's about applying Scripture. Maybe it's not just not about knowing it, but it's about the application of it. Again, being Christ followers and not just Christians. I hope that you've been challenged. I know I'm challenged, and I hope you stick with us, in the, you know, as always, in this series as we journey around the lake, uh, the, the lake of uh, the Sea of Galilee, right? Lake uh, Gennesaret. Um, I hope that you just lean into this, but I hope today you really leaned into it because Jesus is not calling us to be Christians. He's calling us to be Christ followers. So remember, and hopefully you didn't turn this off, but hopefully you remember the two goals that I had. Number one, if you're a Christian, you're going to stop being a Christian and you're going to become a Christ follower. And number two, if you're not a Christian, you're not going to become one, but you're going to become a Christ follower, where your actions and your attitudes all align with Jesus. Your actions and your attitude, your passionate, what your passion, you know, that's going to drive you and motivate you, it's all about what motivated Jesus. Jesus was compassionate about the people. That's why He came. It was all about the will of the Father. And what was that about? It was about to become the ultimate sacrifice of salvation for you and I. So think about it. Is it really about just knowledge? Is it really about the things that we do? Is it really about just one part of our lives that we give to Jesus and then we manage the rest of our lives? Or do you think it's about our entire being, our whole life, where we're truly following Jesus? We are truly His followers, where the most intense love we have seems like hate, seems like hate compared to the love that we have for Jesus. Jesus, I, I absolutely love this, and I hope you're challenged, and I hope you allow the Holy Spirit to challenge you. And I hope this week you would spend some time leaning in, into this, leaning into this uh, as, we, as we continue on this journey around the lake. And today, you know, as I said, we went fishing, right? Because we're going to become fishers, fishermen, fishing uh, people. We're going to fish for people, right? That's who Jesus, that's what Jesus wants us to be, to be individuals where our whole lives are captivated by Him. Our actions, our attitudes are all captivated by Him. And we're not only, I mean, we're loving God with everything we've got, but we're also loving people. We're, we're being the hands and feet of Jesus. Come follow me. I'm not asking you to come be a Christian. Come follow me. The question is, how, how do you define that? And will you follow that? Will you, will you pick up that call? Will you drop, every, will you drop your identity? 
your security? Will you lay it to the side and truly become a Christ follower of Jesus? And maybe you're there. Maybe, you know, again, you know, I just want to, to, to encourage you and celebrate with you. But I think we all need challenge from time, uh, you know, from time to time, right? So I pray that you would just lean into this series with me. I'm so excited about it. And let's continue our journey around the lake. Children and their children and their children. May his name. 